Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's, it's time, time for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom. We have Biomechanics, biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 All right, welcome to Student Voices. Woo! Hannah and I are actually hosting this episode yeah. because we are live in the studio. And we're students, too. And we're students. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking to two students, two PhD candidates in mechanical engineering at Stanford, Chris Dembia and Nick Bianco. Thank you for talking with us. Hello, thanks for having us. And we know Chris and Hi. Nick also because they're in the lab with us. And... They're our friends, too. So. <laughs> and they're on the slow rise to fame in the biomechanics and simulation world as their software aficionados, as their title goes here on our script. <laughs> Who do I hear? Voices. Student is near. Voices. Student. Voices. 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 So we're going to talk to you about MoCo, your new software, kind of is in collaboration with OpenSim. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to start off with our favorite boom questions. Mm -hmm. The first one being, when did you know you wanted to be biomechanist? Well, thanks for having us on the podcast. This is exciting. Yeah, I guess <laughs> you can respond to that. We yeah. just to <laughs> <and> talk <laughs> Cut them off. <laughs> <laughs> I took a class towards the end of my undergrad called Computational Motion, which is about mm. using physics simulations for animation or graphics. And oh, cool. it was a lot of fun. And I was interested in research that had a little bit more real world application. And I would say I was interested in our, our lab more than biomechanics itself because mm. I think our lab provided the kind of opportunities I wanted for big simulation projects. Right. And for those who don't know, we're in the neuromuscular biomechanics lab. But that's very cool. Have you used your animation skills since that class? <laughs> since that class? No, but I once made like a flash animation video. <gasps> oh, fun. <That's> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what about, about you, Nick? Yeah. So I did mechanical engineering my undergrad at the University of Florida, and I had the awesome opportunity to do some undergrad research with BJ Fregley who is now at Rice University, still doing awesome biomechanics research. And I spent two years in his lab, a long time, working on various things, but most of my time was spent doing a project on muscle synergy analysis, which was kind of my gateway into biomechanics. <laughs> and, you know, at the time I was just, I had done an internship and I was just looking for, you know, job opportunities and things that I was interested in. And I found myself just kind of sticking around the lab and, I really enjoyed programming. I had taken BJ's numerical methods class, which mm -hmm. most people didn't like, but I it was <laughs> like one of my favorite. Based on the title, I don't know if I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was one of my favorite classes I'd taken. A lot of that had to do with BJ just being a great teacher. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of came away from that experience being like, well, this feels like something I could do as a career. This is really cool. And so I decided to go to grad school, and BJ was the one who encouraged me to apply at Stanford. I did not think it was not even on my radar. I was applying mm -hmm. to like Michigan and a lot of other great schools. But he's like, oh, you should, you should apply. And here I am yeah. five years oh. later. So by now, podcast listeners will know what we all in the lab know, which is that Nick loves BJ Fregley. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> BJ, if you're listening, I love you dearly. All that I have, I owe to you. And that's only kind of a joke. Well, that was like, casual. <laughs> <laughs> Usually people shout out to, like, their mom, but you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, my mom is probably not going to listen to this. But just in case, I love you too, Mom. <laughs> For those who can't see Nick, he's actually wearing an open sim t-shirt right am, now. Yes. So wow, you, he's a real, real software guru in the field of biomechanics and repping Repping <laughs> Rep <and> hard. <laughs> <laughs> he is what he speaks. <laughs> yeah, that's really awesome and cool that you guys came from, yeah, really, it sounds like actually kind of sort of classes as a first introduction to, to where you wanted to come into biomechanics, which is really awesome, I think, and really speaks to having good professors in different classes. Sometimes that makes the class better than the content, so... 
Yeah. So let's dive in. You recently developed OpenSim MoCo, which is Optimal Control Methods for Musculoskeletal Simulation. And so this is a new software package, part of the open source musculoskeletal simulation software OpenSim. But we want to know what it does. So maybe let's just start with what does MoCo stand for? MoCo kind of stands for Musculoskeletal Optimal Control. Uh Uh-huh. Can it's you explain those acronym. words? For yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> Musculoskeletal <laughs> means systems <laughs> involving a skeleton this driven by muscle actuators. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. optimal control means algorithms that get a system to perform the way you want. So you get to choose like a criterion you want to optimize, such as how fast a movement happens. And then optimal control algorithms find a way to make that quantity minimized. Thanks. That was very helpful. Yeah, you super broke that down. <laughs> <laughs> and we know it employs something called direct collocation. That's correct. <laughs> what is so direct collocation? Yeah. <laughs> so direct collocation is a numerical method. Ah! Call, call back already. <laughs> shout out to BJ. Um, shout out to BJ. <laughs> yes, BJ was doing direct collocation when I was there, and I had no idea what any of it was, and then come to Stanford and end up doing it, which is kind of funny. But <laughs> anyway, direct collocation is a numerical method for solving optimal control problems. It's one of various different ways you can go about doing it. Mm-hmm. Most people are familiar with single shooting methods, which have been fairly popular in biomechanics. Carmichael Ong from our lab has done some really cool research using the Scone software, which uses single shooting, which basically you, to optimize your optimal control criterion, you simulate your dynamics using a forward integration scheme. So if you're familiar with ODE 4.5 and MATLAB or any yeah. sort of numerical integrator, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's basically that's what's going on under the hood. And you simulate the whole system, and then you can evaluate your trajectory, your cost at the end of it, and you pass that to some optimizer to make a decision about what your next set of control should be. And you do that over and over again until you converge. Yeah, so so a term that's popular in biomechanics is predictive simulation, and mm-hmm. more than like five or ten years ago, if someone said predictive simulation, they would have meant single shooting. So there's one of the first papers to do predictive simulation is a paper by Anderson and Pandy, and that is single shooting. I see. And do you want to just speak to maybe like so that we've evolved into direct collocation from single shooting? Maybe just speak to a couple advantages of direct collocation. Sure. So, so well, some of the background is. Direct collocation is a method that appeared in other fields first. And in our field, Tan van der Bogert was one of the first people to really start using the method in biomechanics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, so it departs from single shooting in that your dynamics get included in the optimization process. So instead of integrating your system to satisfy the dynamics, you take each integration step, in a sense, and turn that into an optimization constraint. And then you discretize the problem over time. Mm-hmm. So now... Instead of one long simulation step, you have a bunch of constraints that represent each time step, and now a bunch of variables in your problem, and you get this big, giant optimization problem that you just throw into a gradient-based optimization method, and for reasons that we can get into later, (laughs) it, it actually works pretty well, and that's becoming more popular over some of these single shooting methods for its speed and stability compared to, yeah, single shooting So what's happening at like the current time step updates for the next time step? There's not a sense of like a current time step. Your whole time series, the whole trajectory of your optimization is all happening at once. It's 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 all yeah, it's all being optimized at the same time, which is an advantage. So one of the advantages of this is you can take objectives that can be integrated. So if you want to know, want to minimize metabolic costs, for example. We usually measure that by integrating metabolic rate over time. Mm. And you can only do that if you know the entire solution all at the same time. Uh, So that's one of the advantages of a method like that compared to like CMC, for example, which does a a time-stepping approach. And it is minimizing the objective at every time step, but it has no knowledge of, you know, how much Mm. the muscles are activating at the time before or after. Yeah. So that's a good example of a use case for MoCo. Are there any other examples of what MoCo would be really, some yeah, some problems it's helpful for solving? Yeah. So, well, to start answering that question, Nick 
kind of alluded to something important. Which we started talking about predictive simulation methods, like mm-hmm. single shooting, but we, then Nick was talking about computed muscle control, which is an open sim tool for not predictive simulation, but what we call tracking simulation. Mm-hmm. And so MoCo and, well, direct location that MoCo uses is well suited not just to the predictive simulation, but to pretty wide range of problems you might want to solve in biomechanics. So it's kind of a unifying method. And that means that there's lots of different applications. You could use direct collocation to solve problems like tracking simulations where you have a motion and you just want to estimate quantities that you couldn't measure during that, mm-hmm. during observing that motion, such as muscle forces or joint loading. So that's one category. Another category is the predictive simulations where you don't have data for a motion. You just know at a high level that you want the motion to satisfy some criteria, such as an average walking speed, mm-hmm. or maybe for a jump you want a maximum height jump, but you don't know exactly how to achieve that motion. Mm-hmm. And direct collocation can solve for those motions too. You can also optimize parameters in your model. So maybe you have data that's inconsistent with each other. You have marker trajectories, you have ground reaction forces, and they're not completely consistent. And one way to address that is by calibrating your model's mass parameters, and you could use direct collocation to also optimize parameters in your models, in your model like mass. So it's very tunable, the problems and, and inputs that you can yeah. sort of really shape your problem the way you need it to be done. Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like you guys have made it super accessible whenever you're talking about it and also trying in building it for the community. You've been trying to make it so that people can actually input the problem that they want to solve into your framework. So I think that's huge. And yeah, I feel like that's a key component aside from the technological things, but like just being able to like have user usability um, is huge. Yeah. So designing a new software has to be a huge undertaking. Like what was your inspiration for (laughs) building MoCo? So... I'll start uh, by talking about the story that goes back to when I started grad school. <laughs> We're fortunate in our lab uh, that we run this OpenSim project. Some of our funding involves running workshops where we invite other researchers to campus, to our lab, to mm-hmm. use the software, to use OpenSim and apply it to their research questions. And everyone in our lab will sit down with these other researchers and they'll say, we want to answer this question. And we'll say, okay, here's what you can do with OpenSim. And Oftentimes, there was a kind of a gap between what people wanted to do and what OpenSim offered. And so we'd kind of find workarounds or other ways that they could solve maybe a smaller problem. And so that was kind of frustrating to see that there was this gap in the tools that OpenSim could provide. And so I think early on while I was at in our lab, there was somewhat of an effort to find other alternatives to OpenSim methods like computed muscle control. Like Nick mentioned before, computed muscle control can't handle integrated objectives. And so we were looking at methods that maybe could handle that. So we had actually looked at a bunch of different methods. We had looked at task space control algorithms, which are popular in robotics. We also looked at model predictive control. And we actually spent a lot of time on these alternatives. Though early on in grad school, I once heard AJ Seth mention direct collocation <laughs> in a lab meeting, kind of offhand. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. it sounded like really complicated and like something I would never have to deal with. <laughs> Maybe a similar experience to Nick in, in BJ's lab. Nick, do you have anything to add? To- yeah, I, I was exposed to it while I was doing research as an undergrad. And Anil Rao, who develops the software GPOPs, mm-hmm. which is a MATLAB-based software, well, now C-based, but software for solving optimal control problems, worked right down the hall from BJ. Whoa. And their collaboration kind of more or less kicked off PJ's optimal control research or direct location based research. So I got exposed to it and I remember getting an optimal control lesson from Adele Rao as a, a senior, but I didn't really understand it. <laughs> but it was great. It was great because I knew, I just knew about it and like what it was roughly capable of doing. So when Chris approached me about it in my first year in the lab, I was like, oh, that's that cool thing that going back to. Uh, I love BJ. That's a cool <laughs> thing that BJ was doing. That must be something that I should be interest- so, <laughs> interested in doing. So um, I kind of hopped on the bandwagon. We had a visiting scholar in our lab. So our lab has this visiting scholar program where we have a few researchers spend the summer with us. And one of my early mentors was Jason Moore. I spent some time in, at UC Davis before starting grad school. And Jason Moore was a grad student at UC Davis studying bicycle mechanics. And he kind of moved more into biomechanics. He became a, a postdoc with Tan Vandenberger. And while he was a postdoc with Tan, he came and visited our lab and was using direct collocation. 
And that was kind of new to our lab. He presented to our lab about direct co-location. And people were kind of, at least my memory is that people were kind of skeptical of the method about whether mm-hmm. it really satisfied the dynamics because you weren't doing a forward simulation like you do in single shooting. It's a different way of satisfying dynamics, and it was kind of unfamiliar. So that was kind of the first introduction, the real introduction I think I had to the method. And then the following year, I went to a workshop at a conference, and BJ was giving this workshop. So more, more props to BJ. Uh, and he, he gave this excellent workshop teaching. He, well, there was a Neil Rao there. It was kind of an interesting crossover. This is maybe after you had already been in the lab. This is 2015. Well, yeah. that's when I started at Stanford. So this was oh, like okay. so yeah. So you had already before I came to met Stanford. Anil. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So after Nick had met Anil in Florida, I met Anil and BJ at this conference, and they were giving an excellent workshop teaching about optimal control. And BJ gave this fantastic workshop, really stepping through the details of direct collocation. And then I think I came back with that knowledge to our lab and was very excited about the method and started teaching people in our in our lab more about the method. Wow. It's almost this perfect sort of mix of uh, all these different experiences and meetings and connections and hearing people down the hallway or hearing BJ say direct co-location a lot. <laughs> 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 that came together and I feel like, and you guys also meeting here, gave you guys the perfect skill sets and interest and curiosity to really push this forward. So... It's awesome that all of that kind of happened. Yeah, the hindsight's kind of interesting. Like it looks the... like it makes sense looking back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, I think you told me, because you were talking to Scott, Scott Depp, our advisor, uh, yeah. about wanting to work on this project, and Scott was a little bit hesitant until he heard, he got an email from BJ that it works, the method works and it's good, and Scott was like, okay, you can do it now. So, <laughs> yeah. It's a long, long-winded start to the podcast to say that all the roads of MoCo lead back to BJ. So yeah. it wouldn't have been possible without, without BJ, the origin of it all. Um, How do you think that this no is... No surprise to hear that from Nick. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How do you think that this has fit into the scope of your PhD? It's a good question. I came to the lab, as I kind of mentioned earlier, with this very strong interest in simulation and tools, creating simulation tools. And I think the research I had done previously was more kind of engineering research and less science research where the goal is to answer a question. I think I previously was working on stuff that was more about developing technology, maybe. And Scott really drills it into you, or me, because I kept on asking to work on more methods work, (laughs) that you can't work on a method or a tool in isolation. It has to have an application. Right. Because a bunch of people get excited about a method. They, They create something and they put it out there, but they never tried using it. And if you're not trying to use it yourself, then why can you expect other people to want to use it? Right. And it's very challenging to develop a method as well. Like it's it takes a long time and and so I think you make a great point to make sure that you would use it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was essential <clears throat> guidance and along those lines I think a lot of my work earlier in the PhD involved more original research and and answering scientific questions. It's a tricky thing because the you know at the beginning even when we could get the first problems working with the software, it was like double pendulums and things mm-hmm. that you couldn't really... It wasn't at the level of musculoskeletal simulation research that we would want to do. Mm-hmm. So there was a long build-up time to where we could actually start solving mm-hmm. you know, muscle-driven problems, and that actually wasn't until fairly recently. Yeah, for me, I mean, the scope of my PhD like has been more or less MoCo. <laughs> I, yeah. I, well, I, so I, I spent a year in... Ellen Cool's lab here doing finite element stuff for a little while before I came over to Scott's lab just to get a different perspective. And but finite element analysis has actually a lot of similarities to direct collocation. Hmm. So I feel like I've kind of done similar stuff throughout the PhD so far. Yeah, it, it is going back to the having an application. I think it's hard when you're starting something from the ground up to we had like applications that we wanted to do, like, oh, it would be great to do some predictive simulation stuff or like a tracking type or a study based around tracking problems. But there was a long road till we could actually do that. Well, having that like sort of end larger project in mind, but then being able to break it down into the sort of discrete steps that you have. Kind of like direct co-location. Oh, Uh, (laughs) nice. (laughs) Like is the very essence of a PhD. So I think you're, yeah, it sounds like you both have, have done that with 
how you've been testing on sort of smaller problems, but like always reaching toward the higher goal of actually making this useful for the musculoskeletal simulation community. One thing that students of Scott often hear is that Scott has this kind of policy of if you, he has a policy of like, just go for it. Like, if you, <laughs> have you guys heard him say that? Yeah. Of like, if for you have sure. an idea, don't wait for his approval, just go for it. Yeah. So I think that played into the very origins of the MoCo project of people just, you know, following their interests. But then there is a point where you do have to get Scott on board. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that it, it, you don't just get him on board for free like you do, at least with this project. There was a lot of discussing with him and calls from BJ and whatnot. <laughs> One thing I'll add is we were building this from the ground up, but there was also a lot of people out there, you know, BJ and a lot of Ton and Friedel de Groot, a lot of others using the method at the, you know, at the level of 3D tracking, predictive simulation type research already. So we knew that we could, like the method could solve those types of problems. So mm-hmm. I think it would have been different if we, you know, it wasn't like this method that no one had used that we had no idea if it could actually solve these problems. You know, mm-hmm. we knew that it could work and we just had to figure out how to use OpenSim seamlessly in the in a way that made it easy to use and that you could solve the problems that you wanted to solve. So, yeah, Chris started off the design of the code and then I jumped in, you know, later that year. And there was a lot of time just thinking about how to like the interface and what does it feel like when you interact with the software? That was kind of the starting point. And then we built up the meat of the methods as we went along and just kind of incrementally solved more and more complex problems and added pieces to the direct collocation stuff under the hood to allow us to solve the problems that we wanted to solve. Yeah, I think we did a pretty good job of not over-engineering the software at first. It's tempting to uh, just like create the most perfect feature-rich tool and then start using it, but I think we did a pretty good job of only adding complexity underneath as, as we went along. Before continuing with this awesome interview, Boom wanted to thank Sanford Health for their support with starting the Student Voices segment of Biomechanics on Our Minds. Sanford Health is one of the nation's largest health systems offering integrated care, genomic medicine, senior care and services, research and affordable insurance. And Sanford Health also offers students both clinical and non-clinical internship experiences throughout the year, as well as graduate student training through a partnership with the University of South Dakota Department of Biomedical Engineering. These student opportunities include biomechanics internships through the Sanford Sports Science Institute and Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and Fargo, North Dakota, and provide mentorship, professional development, and growth opportunities, including gaining real-world experience and building useful skills to prepare you for the future. To learn more about student opportunities at Sanford Health, you can visit sanfordhealth.jobs. And what's it been like working both, I would say, like together on this project and then also working with so many others Mm -hmm. to build MoCo. I've personally always envisioned it as a very collaborative project. Mm -hmm. I think I had dreams of it being even more collaborative beyond (laughs) our lab. Going back to my previous mentor, Jason Moore, I think he taught me a lot about open science and Mm -hmm. open source software. And coming to this lab with this OpenSim project, I had this idea of OpenSim being extremely collaborative. Mm -hmm. And this project is being the way that we might open up OpenSim to being even more collaborative. I think as time has gone on, I've realized that a lot of open source projects still usually just have a core of people who work on it because it Mm -hmm. takes a long time to understand a full code base and you can't expect outside contributors to just get that knowledge instantly. Right. I would say the way that it's been collaborative with people beyond our lab has been in just conversations and in talking with people who have expertise that we're only starting to have uh, and just just learning from them more than like actual lines of code. Nick, how about you? Yeah, I can I can speak to more of like the dynamic of Chris and I working together, and that's <laughs> I mean that's been my favorite part of grad school. You don't uh, have to say that just because he's here. <laughs> no, no, I would I would happily say that whether Chris was here or not. No, I mean, so yeah, I mean, so I said before, Chris started the design of the software and. You know, I don't think, you know, MoCo wouldn't have happened without 
his initiative. And I really learned how to be a developer in the process of mm-hmm. contributing to this project. So I started just by working on some examples and test cases, which are at the you know the very top layer of the code of like basically just using the interface that Chris made, and then slowly delved deeper and deeper into the code to implement the things that I wanted to do and the things that I thought were going to be the most impactful or most helpful to the project. And I mean, I, I guess I should say going into grad school, some of my secondary, I guess, objectives of grad school were to get some software development experience. And this seemed like a perfect alignment when Chris came up, approached me about this project. And given my interest in numerical methods and my background <laughs> in that, I was like, oh, wow, this is like a perfect opportunity. And then on top of that, Chris is a very talented programmer, coder, if you don't if you don't know, he does a lot of stuff and opens him behind the scenes. So I've been able to learn a ton just working from him. A lot of that I've learned from AJ, Seth, and other people in the lab, too. <laughs> yeah. So it, I think that this project has been kind of a mini side project. Not a mini. It's been big. But a side a project of the, made, the main OpenSim software. <laughs> but I think it follows in the ethic of the lab where mm-hmm. people come in and to do some bu- simulation research and then <laughs> they spend a few extra years writing all the code. Um, it's yeah. so nice though because I think, you know, a lot of times your PhD can be kind of isolating or you feel like you're working on this project alone. So it must have been nice to have something where you're really like leaning on each other and when you mm-hmm. feel stuck, you have somebody to talk to and bounce, bounce ideas off, off of. Yeah. 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 It's been amazing to work together. I think also we're very fortunate. I think it's not we got very lucky. I think a lot of times when two people, I remember the, some of the team-based projects I did in undergrad, like in the first week of us being teamed up to design like some widget, there was yeah. just interpersonal conflicts and like people wanting to have more control over what happens. <laughs> it's so easy. It's like the norm for when people team up for there to be some friction. Yeah. But with this project, I, I think we very quickly just shared the same vision for what, we both understood the same vision for what we wanted to create. So it's kind of a boring story in that way. Yes. Uh, no Why drama? is there no conflict? Yeah. We want drama. Yeah. We should lock you in that booth a little longer. <laughs> well, have you ever had any, not drama, but may, but we always talk about research fails, but like together, have you experienced some, you know, conflict or some trials and tribulations when you're going I, through this process? I don't think there's not been conflict. I don't think there's anything but between it that's, that's risen to the level of conflict. <laughs> I would say good. that like our motivations over time have mm. you know ebbed and flowed or waxed and waned, I guess. <laughs> and when we're productive on writing code has, has kind of gone up and down and a lot of times they've not overlapped, <laughs> which has been actually a really that's great works, thing. Yeah. yeah, there's times where Chris is just super productive and I'm just like reviewing a lot of stuff that's he's done. Mm-hmm. And then there's times where I'm like, I'm going to do this feature. And I just like go after it for three months. Yeah, it's not this like every every week I write 200 more lines. It, you guys are just high-fiving all day. Yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely not like that. And, and there's a lot of stuff that we, you know, spent a lot of time on and mm-hmm. like didn't work. Like, you know, getting ground contact for example, that didn't happen until this past summer when Antoine was here contributing. And mm. Chris and I spent a lot of time trying to get just simple examples to work well. And none of it worked. And it's all buried in like <laughs> miscellaneous files in the source <laughs> code. Same with muscles. Like that was a big thing that just didn't work until we basically stole all of Friedel and Antoine and BJ's muscle <laughs> modeling code and put it into Moco. Shared. Collaborated. Um, shared. Yeah. Shared. <laughs> uh, yes. It's open source. Open, yeah, exactly. Collaborative. Yeah. yeah. I guess, I don't know, do you have anything more? That's more like, yeah. that's more like technical, practical thing. That's not really like, like personal drama or things that affect you. don't have much. to go for personal drama. <laughs> no, like, it's just, a good question. That's like, a good question. Well, I, yeah. So there are definitely, it's true that there were a lot of like false starts with the software. There's a lot of, like, yeah, we tried contact in one way, and then, yeah, like Nick said, we just kind of put that code away <laughs> and started again. That happened a lot. So we don't want to give the impression that, like, we just wrote something and it worked. It's definitely true that we've been able to alternate in our, in our sessions of productivity. There was some time last year when I was really struggling and not being productive at all. Basically, I wasn't coming to lab, 
And that was a period during some of that time, Nick was getting a lot of stuff done. And then towards the end of the year, I made a big push and I, I got surprised myself. I got a lot done. And then I feel like I've done like very little this year. <laughs> 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 so I, I think it's been nice to just kind of embrace that spontaneity. I feel like your motivation kind of ebbs and flows. And so when Mm-hmm. it's high you really have to take advantage of that yeah. and then you know when it's not there sometimes it's kind of an indication that you need a little bit of time to refresh and kind of just like clear organize your thoughts and take a little break and then hopefully it usually it comes back <laughs> yeah. but it's I think yeah. it's amazing that you guys sort of can hand that off because it makes me wonder if like we all in our PhDs when we like kind of reach a sticking point if we just had some bot that like <laughs> seemingly made progress in our project that like that motivated us to like then go yeah. back and like cuz i think having that other thing like melissa said it can be so isolating sometimes but having another person another force to sort of be pushing along and also motivating you i think is huge yeah i think i'd love it if a PhDs were a team project well just like two people I think more than that would be great but like I would love to have like a partner that I'm doing my PhD with I feel like uh, yeah that would make things a lot more fun and make me more productive but you know I think that's also based on your personality and Mm -hmm. and how you like to work too momentum is so important in research projects Mm -hmm. I think yeah Mm -hmm. I never said this to Nick but there was a a period of time (laughs) at the beginning of 2018 Nick got really into skiing and he was at this time he was yes he was splitting his time between Moco and other more important research, so Moco at that time was really just his side gig, mm-hmm. and then, and then he would go skiing. So, so then he didn't have time <laughs> like, for Moco. How dare you be healthy? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Who's I watching felt, the baby? I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I never said that. Um, wow, the booth brings well, everything out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought oh, you should. Uh, Talk to my wife, Emily. So she <laughs> has very similar feelings about about my time being dedicated too much to skiing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I was gonna say it was. It's been interesting having like the Moco as a like software project, and then I was trying to do research since it is grad school. And that's what everyone we're supposed out to here do. trying to do research. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was trying to like have equal amounts of time towards both things. It is kind of nice in a way where, you know, you're working on the details of like just a straightforward or a simulation project, like a more research type thing. And, you know, you kind of hit a point of saturation where it's like, I just, you know, I'm tired of looking at these like muscle activations and they're not matching. And let me just put this down and go, you know, create a new class for this. So you can, I could go back and forth and then you, you know, I spend some time writing something in Moco, and then I'm like, you know, I feel a little guilty. I should probably do some research. <laughs> and so I think that just that work balance has been mm. a good thing. I just wanted to comment that, like, aside from being, like, super technologically savvy and and being able to hand off work-wise and production-wise to each other, you guys are also some of the most chill and, like, kind and thoughtful people that and I know. And funny. And funny. So I think that, like, <laughs> not to just pitch, like, partner phd projects to the whole world right now but i think it really takes a special type of person and i think there's a huge credit to the things that you guys mentioned that made this collaboration work but i also think that it needs to be said and acknowledged that like who you guys are has also been a huge part of making this work so i'm happy you have that impression (laughs) (laughs) Me too. i think i really do resonate with your partner phd mentality it's not something, at least from our experience in U.S. university system, mm-hmm. well, at least Stanford and my, you know, exposure <laughs> to the grad student life at Florida. You know, you're in this lab with a lot of, hopefully, people that you like. Um, sometimes that's not always the case. We're very fortunate to have a, a really awesome lab, uh, a lot of mutual support and encouragement, and it's really awesome. Yeah, I, I always wonder if if things were more team-based, if it feel more natural because if you go to industry or, Mm. you know, even a startup in in some ways it feels like this project has been a little mini startup between Mm -hmm. the two of us. There's a lot of benefits from being able to work on the same thing. And you have two perspectives coming at the same problem Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all the time. And that's really helpful. I think that can move things along a lot faster Mm. in some ways, but 
that type of environment is also subject to the dynamic of the people that are in it. Right. Too. So yeah, it can go, it can go both ways. But if you do find people you like working with, it can be a really awesome experience. And I, it has been for for me and Chris. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. So we'll wrap up um, with one of our favorite questions, which is. What are you most excited about for the future of biomechanics or, in your case, the future of MoCo? So to kind of come full circle to what we, what I was saying at the beginning about open some workshops and there being this gap in the methods available, not just because of MoCo, but because of other advancements in our field, I think there's been a huge change since I joined the lab in terms of uh, what's available to people to solve ambitious software uh, simulation problems. There's also this project called Scone out now, which can do predictive simulations. When I joined the lab, Jack Wang had Tim Dorn working on this project for predictive simulation for walking, and that was very exciting. It was kind of new work, and it was something that they could do, but it was definitely not something that any typical biomechanist, biomechanist could do. It required a lot of software expertise. And with Scone and MoCo and other changes in the field, I think we're really in a different place now. So I think hopefully we're now at a, a point where we can spend less time getting tools up and running and just start using the tools and focus more on applications. But I think that it puts a highlight on the fact that the harder problem, I think more than the simulation tools, is developing accurate models. So modeling metabolics correctly is difficult. Modeling the nervous system, modeling fatigue, there's a lot of modeling tasks that are really difficult for our field. Mm -hmm. And that might be harder than getting the simulation tools up and running. And now that we've made good progress with simulation tools, I think those challenges are more clear. It's clear that those are big challenges. Yeah. Yeah. An, an equal buzzword to predictive simulation, I think, has been subject-specific modeling. Mm -hmm. And there's already stuff out there like the Musculoskeletal Atlas Project, which is based out of Tor Bazir's group, which is a pipeline for quickly taking data and creating a subject-specific model using some really cool databases of bone geometry meshes and using that to scale models quickly. And I think that stuff is, yeah, in a lot of ways, a lot harder <laughs> than what we're doing. Uh, optimal control is very like clean and straightforward, I guess well-defined once you understand it, but replicating the body, replicating biological systems on a subject-specific level in a way that you need to to solve you know, questions we have in, in musculoskeletal biomechanics research is a very difficult thing. As one of the appeals to me of biomechanics, it's just a, the body is a very difficult problem. It's interesting, and there's a lot of open challenges still. We're a long way away from being able to you know, solve to the level of detail that the way our, our bodies are designed. So, right. yeah, and I agree with Chris about the methods being available and transparent in a way that lets the research come to the front. And we got, we got a, a glimpse of that in the... March advanced user workshop. Uh, we had Jessica Allen and her student Hannah working with MoCo on a standing balance problem. And this was the first time we had really given the software out to other people to use. And within a couple days, they were, you know, like, oh, what if we, what if we use this cost function? Oh, what if we like change the perturbation this way? And, you know, they were, they were saying all these things that sounded like research and not like, oh, why, why isn't this converging or why yeah. why is my model like upside down or and that was really exciting cuz that's where we really want the software to be. It's, yeah. You know, people can and pick it up and just test their research ideas and it's not always going to be smooth and walking is a very challenging optimization problem but I think the end goal is to create tools that let the research questions drive mm. the actual work that you're doing the the knobs that you're turning. Nick, do you have any specific things you're excited about for MoCo itself or things to add or feature, features? or? I think, so we've added a lot of features this year. And it's getting really close to the toolbox that I would want to have. There's a couple things. So more recently, we've been able to solve 3D tracking problems and predictive problems with foot ground contact, which is pretty far along the high end of the complexity problem complexity spectrum mm -hmm. wow. which is really exciting and there's ways that we can improve that so a lot of a lot of studies have 
have done these tracking problems where they'll track marker data and ground reaction forces. And we don't have a ground reaction force tracking module yet, but that is something we'd like to add. We've mostly focused on like predicting motion type problems, but there's other avenues to explore, mostly around like parameter optimization. Mm -hmm. So an important thing for a lot of simulation studies, for example, if you want to predict knee contact forces, one thing that is proven to be important is to calibrate your model. So calibrating the passive structures in the model, calibrating the optimal forces in the muscles has a big impact on how well you predict the contact loads in the knee. And one thing that I've liked to do that I haven't been able to try yet is create a calibration tool in MoCo mm -hmm. that lets you input EMG data, input walking motion, maybe some other some other inputs, and then it'll pop out. You'd go from a, a scaled model to a scaled calibrated model. And this is, this is getting closer to the subject-specific simulation point I was making earlier. To have a tool that makes that process smoother would be great, because right now there's not a tool out there that, well, I guess the MAP project does some calibration type models, but I don't know if EMG calibration is is on the list of things. Check with Tor. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that would be a valuable addition. And if someone yeah. wants to learn more about MoCo or use MoCo, uh, how can they go about doing that? We have a website, mm -hmm. opensim.stanford.edu slash MoCo. Yeah. Oh. That's the best place to go. We have a blog. Okay. Oh, cool. I didn't know you had a blog. There's just like two posts right now. <laughs> um, but we hope to add posts as we go with notes about releases or just things we've tried any cool. information that might be useful to users and are you two individually like on twitter or no no <laughs> well if people have questions they can tweet at, at us and yeah. then we'll relay we'll the message them to you. <laughs> yes, please do. or you can Moco. find them find them online it's chris dembia and nick bianco you can um, fax me at <laughs> you can notes. you can page him <laughs> <laughs> Or you can uh, and you can follow Biomechanics on our minds at on Twitter at Biomechanics O O M. But thank you so much for being on the show. This has been really fun. And even though we're in lab together, Hannah and I don't often yeah. get the chance to talk to you about some of this stuff. So it's been cool for us to learn about it too. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Yeah, so, thanks for having us. It's, it's a fun. lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Should we biomechanics off our minds? Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> so we typically end the show by saying one, two, three, and then we go biomechanics off our minds. But it, uh, it, yeah. Yeah. You it's never really that? off our minds, right? Yeah, it's, it's like 9 a.m., so it's going to be on our minds for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay, you ready? One, two, three. Biomechanics Bio off our minds. minds. Thanks for listening to Student Voices, a series by Biomechanics on Our Minds by students and for students. If you have an idea for an episode of Student Voices, or if you want to host your own episode, please reach out to us at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com or tweet at us at biomechanicsoom. We'd love to hear from you. Let's keep these conversations going. 